Hello, Mike. You good? Hi, man. Yes. How's the weather down there? It's it's cold. It's <laughs> warm down for the second day. So, how's everything there, man? Well, uh, finishing up the last things before going to Belgium again on Sunday. So. Oh, all right. How's how's that going? Oh wait. Oh uh, well, that's going good so far. Yeah, uh, Netherlands have a lockdown as well, but you can call it a lockdown light compared to Belgium. Oh, all right. <laughs> so in the Netherlands, you were still allowed to go to the gym, like to play basketball. In Belgium, everything is like forbidden really? from twelve and wow. up. Wow. For for how long? When is that? Uh, Mid December, at least. Oh, okay. Well, we'll see. Any idea how many people will be in? Uh, depending on everybody that asks for the link, might be some miscalculations on the time that time difference stuff like that. Well, we will see how many will enter. All right, we'll see. I see the other man. The other man of the hour, <laughs> Paul T, joined as well, and. For everybody in here that doesn't already know it, we might have a special guest coming in and doing a Q and A. Yeah, you already know it, Diogo. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see how it goes then. For sure, mate. Is that yeah? You good, Paul? I don't know if it's yeah. I'm good. <laughs> Perfect. Nice, nice. I see we got everybody joining as well. Hey, Mike, you want to open up the uh, screen share? Oh, for sure, mate. Here you go. How's everything over there, Paul? With with the COVID? We were in lockdown. Oh, so right. um yeah, we're pretty much two weeks in. We were at like fifteen hundred cases, I think, something like twelve, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred. And now we're down as of yesterday. I haven't even checked today's one. Yesterday we were five forty four with a two day increase, but we we're on a three day decrease prior to that. We're, not doing, we're getting it down. We're only two weeks into a six-week lockdown, so I think we're not doing too bad. Okay, nice, nice. Wait a sec. I see. I see. Mike McKay has joined as well. Hi, Mike. Hello, Mike. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. How are you over? There? How are you doing over there? Well, depends what part of the country. If you're in Atlantic, Atlantic Canada is pretty well opened up. School leagues are starting up, but you to go there, you have to have a two-week quarantine. Mm. Uh, Quebec is total lockdown. Haven't been in a gym since September. Ontario, you can be in your own gym, but you can't go to another gym. Uh. Manitoba, Winnipeg just went lockdown Monday. Saskatchewan and Alberta have just reported a lot of cases, and they're ex expecting some lockdown. And BC is almost back to full opened up so it's quite and I'm trying to run a, a camp in December but it's not going to happen it's going to be a virtual regional depending on what your conditions are so yeah quite an interesting thing to do that will be uh, a challenge for everybody we already got five camps cancelled out here in Belgium as well and yeah we never know what the future will bring they can change the days and the, the, or they can change the restrictions day by day so All right. Um, I think some more people are joining in, but um, before doing that, we got um, two, two, and actually a third one, uh, three coaches joining us today. At first, we got Diogo, and we got Paul. Diogo from Portugal, now coaching in, uh, in England. We got Paul. Paul is the um, head coach of the national team in, uh, in Ireland. 
And um, next to that, we got a late addition. Um, Coach Mike McKay um, sent me a message that he was uh, free this evening for us and was willing to do and was willing to do uh, some kind of Q&A or anything else in that particular order um, next to the two guys already presenting. So um, to make that clear, we're going to start off with Diogo. Are you cool to start? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, after that, if you have any questions, please mention them in the chat. I will fire them away at the coaches. If you have a, a particular question to a particular coach, make sure you type in the name of the coach. Um, to the coaches that are not presenting or anything like that, if you want to answer the question yourself already, go ahead. Um, I will record this uh, Zoom call. I will make sure I send it to you on Twitter. If you don't have it, please make sure to ask me. I will upload it via WeTransfer or make you a YouTube link um, so you can see it again. If you're ready to go, Diogo. Perfect. If you can let me share the screen, but... Uh, in the I'm, meantime, I'll just say that it's, it was actually, I didn't have anything prepared. I just tried to, to gather some, some drills uh, yeah. that we've tried to do. Uh, if I'm correct, you, you should be able to screen, uh, screen record. Oh, okay. Screen. Uh, Perfect. No, that, yeah, I can do it now. Um, let me check. Can you guys see? Yeah, Mike? yeah, 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 we can see you, man. So, yeah, so the idea really um, it's just to share what we've been doing do, during this preseason. Um, I, I was just looking to the percentages of, of the phases of the drill that we've been doing, obviously, more or less, because most of, I mean, 90% of the, our practices plan are, are completed, but some of the stuff it's not, uh, doesn't go accordingly. But I think we did 20 to 25 percent of uh, of on-air stuff um ranging from individual technique to other stuff so and changing that from what i was used to do uh in my first years of of coaching uh, i can really see the change and it, at least for me it was kind of just stepping out of my comfort zone and just not going with what i was used to so i'll just skip how can you uh, I'll skip this part, just saying about the, the individual technique, um, obviously there's still space for, for on-air stuff and, and maybe the title is not the best thing uh, as possible. It was the first thing that came to my mind, eliminating, elim eliminating um, on-air stuff, but really just trying to reduce as much as possible if, if we can. So here just a list, and I can share this with you, Mike, or anyone uh, on Twitter, uh, probably, but uh, just ways that we try to go, we still go on air, especially for individual technique, but we try to go uh, with with this stuff, with the external cues, uh, just to make it more uh, uh, variable and random rather than just block on air stuff. Um, and one of the ways we have been trying to do that is just uh, uh, putting um, or using three reps in a row for the offensive play if we are if we are working on by pairs or whatever whatever it is but just trying to get those three rep, reps um, in a row so we can then um, like add um, variables or different reads and different cues uh, so really we'll just go through the drills uh, if you want to to make any questions if you want to I don't know add something please please do um, and again, this is just what we've tried to do so far. So no, no there is no science here. Um, so one of the things that I started by talking about defense, just because we've really tried to uh, eliminate like those uh, on-air drills where everyone closes out on, on a, in a cone or, or something like that, that, like that, or maybe the the typical half court drill that we uh, full court drill, but the zigzag until the half court and then it's live. We, we really tried to eliminate because uh, we felt that we could constrain the, the drills in order for, for the players to, to, to improve in the same, in the same way or, or even more. So here limit the offense to improve the defense. Um, I actually, I think, it, I, I'm not sure, but I probably took this from, uh, from Mike, but the, if we want to improve um, 
the, the offensive side, then we can limit what the defense does uh, rather than limiting the offense. Uh, and so the same thing for uh, in the other way around. So we really try to narrow the space and limit the space of the of the offensive player uh, to play. And then in that way, it's the the, the job is much easier um, to to try to 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 con like to contest the the, the one on one here. Um, obviously, here we try to also emphasize. Um, so for the ones that are probably not understanding, um, just splitting the court in different lines. And so uh, we have only this area to play one-on-one. -on -one. After the cones, it's live and they can use all the court, but we really try to emphasize on, on the dribbling part. Um, so yeah, just a few loads there. Uh, what we tried to add on the with the same uh, dynamic. Uh, once they can do it, we probably extend the limit a, a little bit more. Um, Sometimes we did limit the, the number of dribbles or not exactly the number of dribbles, but we could say the offense has three dribbles. And then if they want more dribbles, they have to use the retreat dribble. We just did that uh, in order to, for the defender to stay in the same distance uh, within the, the offensive player. Uh, we, we felt that that bit of, of the drill was, was actually important. Uh, but so the loads would be uh, expanding the, um, the, the, the space where the offensive player can, can dribble, then doing it after a made, so the, the defensive player will just uh, make a, a score a layup or, or a shot, whatever it is, and then a coach would get that ball and try to inbound it. So we get some type of, uh, of that's uh, uh, the changing the mindset of I'm playing defense, obviously he's not really playing defense, and then trying to, I'm playing offense, and then going to play defense and, and deny the pass. So the, the drill is exactly the same. We just had that. And then we can actually mix with something else, which is having um, a coach in the corner. And then after the, the off court line, um, or, or even before, but the, the player can pass to the, to, the, to the coach. And then we are in a, a denying stance at working uh, in that. So probably here with the under 14 is much more about seeing both things uh, than, than so very simple. Uh, we actually found this part uh, very interesting for, for the offensive uh, side as well. Obviously, it's not our goal, but we, we could use for that as well. Uh, because we would say that if the defender, for example, if the defender is behind on, or, or on the hip of the offensive player, then he's allowed to go to the basket and to just try to score because he has an advantage. If he's in a neutral situation, being uh, chest to chest, then he has to pass. So from the offensive point of view, in the beginning, they struggle a bit with that because they weren't used to, to something like this or to have to think about it. Um, guys, any questions? I know I, I try to speak fast, but anything, just let me know. Um, and yeah, then uh, on the defensive side as well, uh, we just try to, we play this three on three uh, continuous. Here, the, the, um, even if, if there is a, a defensive rebound or, a miss, uh, the new offense still has to inbound the ball from, from the baseline. We, ju we try to do this because we want uh, uh, to, to press the, or to deny the, the first pass of, of, from, the off from the offense. Um, and here, really, w one thing that at some, in, especially in the beginning we had to do, we, the new offense only could go when the coach uh, would whistle. So we, we got, uh, uh, some kind of the advantage for the defense to get ready, but obviously as as the drills as as the drill went on, the, the goal is to is to try to to avoid that and be as fast as possible. Um, and then here, the, just just to explain the goal, uh, what we want really is to get the ball ahead as an, as as, as uh, from an offensive point of view, and then what we would look at from a defensive point of view is to be on the ball line rather than staying behind with my own man. That was probably our biggest emphasis with, with the transition defense. Um, and then some loads here. Uh, we'd also, we also did this by adding cones, um, like, like wider than the, the elbows probably, but just for the offense to have to dribble uh, uh, between the, the sideline and those cones, just again, to give some, some advantage to the defense. Um, and also we started to say that, for example, in this situation, if the, if the player number one 
uh, is on the on the ball line and his defender, uh, his player is far behind, then they could trap. So obviously that that needs uh, that demands some communication. But we we gave that the, that freedom to the players, uh, and then again to get more of those uh, reps or, or more of this situation of the ball being uh, being ahead. Uh, we just had a, so exactly the same drill, but then the players on the free throw line extended would become passers to to the other team. Um, so if they get the, pa the the ball ahead, then obviously we will have to sprint back to be on the ball line or or, or similar. And then obviously timing, uh, we we use that quite a lot when it's transition stuff. But getting I don't know 15 seconds for this whole or 10 seconds for this whole thing to 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 happen. Uh, obviously, again, as an advantage for the defense. Uh, then something we, we call it chicken drill, but really it, it, it's, it was interesting why we call it, but we, we wanted to, to emphasize that the players would have some accountability and they, they could actually change how things worked within our practices. Um, and so in the beginning, like probably second uh, um, practice, they were quite shy yet, but uh, we just asked them to give to think about the name for this drill. They said something like fast break, so that wouldn't work. And then one of the assistant coaches just asked, what's the favorite food of, of you, Justin? And he came up with chicken, so we call it that. To be fair, it's the drill that they love, and they, they got it straight away. We don't need to say anything else, rather than two on two or, or three on three, four on four. But really, uh, so the teams uh, that are uh, out of the game uh, have a basketball in the corners. And so as soon as there is a, there is a miss, uh, sorry, there is a defensive rebound or a mate. So if they are offensive rebound, they keep on offense. Uh, the new guys can join just dribbling up the court. So really, this is for the defensive uh, uh, transition to go as fast as possible and to, to change the mindset. Uh, ways of trying to, to reduce the, the on-air stuff. And I, I had that debate with, with some coaches here in the club. But why doing on-air stuff, especially with, with conditioning, uh, maybe like running around the court, some coaches do it, or even just suicides for the sake of it. Uh, we, we prefer this and, and the kids prefer it as well and they get tired and, and it works their, their conditioning for sure. Um, then spicing, Diego, I think this was, sorry. Diego, one moment. Could you go back one slide, please? We got a, I, I got a question, but it was sent personally Perfect. to me in the chat. Um, first off, I have a question. Would you, load this one up 5v5 in a youth team like under 14 or would you say i'm not going 5v5 yet with under 14s uh i mean we rarely go to five on five to be fair uh, at least this preseason so if we could keep it uh, uh four on four three on three that would be perfect um but for example if you got 20 players uh going five on five would work perfectly with with um with the conditioning part and as well probably running behind the defense on for, from the offensive point of view that would be good as well i think that that would work and you could see some of that stuff just because there are more players so they have to 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 be aware of that but i mean just up to you really what, what whatever you you prefer i think w with our under 14s the max we did was four and four so yeah that's my answer so so you would um Base the decision more like on how many players you have, or would you say with with fifteen to twenty players, I would still use three or three on four and four, so they have less actual reps for conditioning wise, but more space to learn in the environment. Or um... yeah, I mean it, it really depends where you put the emphasis. Because if you are doing this just for the sake of the uh, the defensive mindset uh, and and from a defensive point of view probably maybe adding more players. So going into five on five would actually make it a bit more easy. It's easier at some point, just because players are very used to play. If you do this three on three, the amount of situations you'll get a two on one or three on two, it's much higher than if you play five on five. So it really depends where you want to put the emphasis on. At least that's, that's my view. Yeah, no, 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 that's no problem. That's, that's exactly what we are looking for. It's your, your point of view in this, in this one. Um, so I got a question and if I'm translating it right, it's like, um, so in this drill, the defense still stays the, 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 the defense. So um, red after that will also defend the solid blues. So the full color blues. So, 
So uh, let's say these blue ones, if whenever they score or the defensive side wins the um, wins the the rebounds, then they are playing defense back here. So it's always reds against yellow, um, reds against blues or blues against reds. That would okay. be. And then obviously from a scoring point of view, you can do it by trios. In this case, this, this three would count as a team, or you can do by the, these six blue players because everyone will be like, the blues will always be on this baseline. The reds will always be on that baseline. Okay. I hope no. that makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah, so, that was it. Yeah. Perfect. Then here from uh, more offensive side now, but here this, this came from Chris Oliver, I think from a few years ago. Um, but yeah, just trying to, to work on spacing and, and the passing window. Um, without so working on three on one so uh, uh, the ball starts in the middle rotates to the other side uh, and then four can drive baseline or um or middle and then here the defender we we, we load it in different ways but the defender can just take one of uh, one of the passing options uh and then that player shoots the one who receives shoots or we can even do that this player has to kick it out and then this player can actually play defense to 1-1. One, one. Uh, there we could add some, some pa uh, passing uh, limitations. So no, obviously no more than, than three passes, for example, otherwise it would be an endless uh, and pointless drill. Uh, but really what we want here, and especially with our under 14s, uh, was passing off the dribble because they, they weren't very good in the beginning. And we wanted to reduce the timing of on air just passing because there is not a timing point of view uh, 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 and the passing with in window either so but we'll, we'll i'll explain more about that uh after and then here for for spacing purposes so we added uh exactly the same on the left side but then we added one more defender so he could uh guide the drive it, we could actually add some cones to shade left or shade right or it could be straight, uh, straight one on one um, f from here. Obviously, playing uh, three against two. What we usually say is that this player cannot uh, shoot. The only the only way he can shoot if the, if is if the defender number two sacks and gives him space. But usually, we try for that not to happen. Um, and then here we added, so again, still uh, three on one, just diff different location. So we drive to the, to the opposite side of the players. And then we do exactly the same thing as the first one, as trying to get the, the passing window right. Uh, what we, we would ask for spacing purposes is for this player probably to hold the corner and the player number three to, to come high uh, a bit. Obviously, we can load it to two on two uh, and because one of our uh, uh, emphasis will be later on, it, well, if we have a season, uh, is to play this blast cut, this dynamic one-on-one, uh, if this player number three receives the ball. Um, and then here, exactly the same, but just for the other, uh, for the other side, uh, or, or, I mean, this player can drive both sides, but we do the same, but now this player number four becomes a defender. Uh, and it's just two on two. It actually, it wasn't one of the first goals, but what we started to learn is that if they would drive, so to the side of this play number three, it would be a, a actually good moment to talk about the ghost cuts, just because probably is, is, if, if we got the, the guided read uh, right on this one-on-one, -on, -one, on this closeout, probably play, defender number four would just try to help uh, completely at this level, so it would be a good time to just talk about ghost cutting or, or spacing to the corner. Um, Diogo, I got a question. So now it's two, two sure. slides back um, in the three v one. Um, in that scenario, um, does he? So I got a question. Um, does it suggest where the player has to pass the ball? I mean, both feet in the lane. Oh, where does this player has to pass the ball? Yeah. Uh, to be fair, we didn't talk about it, but what we wanted, like we, we didn't put any emphasis on it, but what we wanted is before the hoop to hoop line. So you, you might have situations where this player tried to avoid the passing decision so light, but we didn't want that. So probably just two dribbles, max three dribbles at this level and then passing. Obviously here it's not totally real because this player should be able to score, but for the purpose of it, we just tried to two, three dribbles and then 
he passes. All right, perfect, mate. All right, uh, where are we? Okay, so now here is spacing and getting dynamic one-on-ones. Uh, so obviously we, we also play, uh, one thing that we did quite a lot was let's just look at this left side. We would play uh, dynamic um, stationary one-on-one. Um, so coach would pass to the player number one and then defender at the, at the precise time would have to touch one cone or just step one cone. And then that would be uh, our, our rates. Uh, shading left or right, what we added was, okay, now the, the coach can actually pass or drive. And then if we drive, uh, players without the ball should move accordingly. This, this was our first uh, uh, scripted thing that we did. And then if then we kick, that, we kick out the ball to the corner, for example, then we play live. So without any cones, without any guided stuff. Uh, Later, we started to introduce, actually it was probably two weeks ago, just what happens if this defender number two um, like completely helps on the ball or something like that. Then we would introduce again the, the ghost cuts. So both drills would, would work as like a probably third key point uh, of offense, uh, off emphasis for us. Um, and very easy, uh, we did this with a post player as well, just to see how they would react to the drives, uh, but very easy to add to three on three or maybe just interior spots on, on the dunker spot weak side, for example, whatever it was. Uh, do you have a question? Mike? Yeah, I see a question in the chat coming up. Um, does he also put a defender under the basket in the drills on drives and kick principles? Uh, so, so what does that mean? Uh, so most likely it will mean that um, the defender underneath the basket will either give you um, the drive inside or will give you the pass option outside. So it's not only just passing without anybody in front of you. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. If that's correct, Armando, otherwise, please feel free to jump in and, and um, exp <laughs> explain your question. Yeah, what I noticed myself is that, that I run similar drills. And then if you have a guided defense guiding the, the driver to, okay, baseline or middle, uh, then if there's nobody in front, uh, I think it's good to, to, to learn the pass that way, but it's not an actual read in, as far as you can just go to the, to the, to the basket and make a layup. Like why does so he pass? I, I find it myself. Like I'm, I'm, I'm are, are we talking this about place. this one here? Yes, for instance, or the one I think before that. So, uh, pro if it's that this one here, we just wanted to control uh, and to concentrate the the drive of the plane rather than being drive to wherever you wherever you want. Then it would have to be something uh, obviously more more uh, that would make more sense and more, more realistic obviously if we can we would add probably a third defender and now player number four could actually score uh and w the third player could be helping out on this drive and then we'll have like a dominant situation extra pass and, and that kind of stuff obviously here did just very much the basics and again the, the goal of the drill was just the spacing itself and the passing so but so yeah, I, I, I totally we, agree. we can always ask um, Mike. I know you're still in here as well. Um, what do you suggest? What will you um, do in this kind of situation? Would you put an extra defender in the driving kick scenarios for teaching that decision, or would you separate those and make the driving kick scenario only on the extra pass or on the finish and not doing both at the same time? To me, it's always your context. To me, I would always start with a pure three on three or four and four or five on five and see where the struggle is for my athletes and not assume that everybody's starting at zero and then I go to one, then I go to two, then I go to three. To me, with limited gym time, I want to know where they are and then I would adjust accordingly. If they struggle to make the pass against the help defender at the rim, then I'm going to put that person in if I'm limited in what I'm doing, but as much as possible, I'm going to try to make it as realistic with offense and defense in all the positions. But then by constraining what they do, it focuses on what we want to work on. 
I'm not big on a lot of uh, these kind of drills where I'm, I'm not having defense in and everything because I just don't have enough time. I don't have, a, I've only get so many practices. I got to get right to the heart of the matter. Now, having said that, maybe with player four, they just need to work on making the pass. They, they don't even, can't even think about the decision yet. Just step that defender out when they do it. But then someone else is get the big post player in there is going to help because they struggle with help at the rim. So it's just, it's again, a customizing it a little bit to, to know what each player needs also. Is that's another little thing we try to do with our, our program. Because again, we just don't have a lot of time. So we go right to the game as much as possible. Yeah, and you're going to deload it basically until you hit that spot you want to teach. That's right. You deload till you hit the sweet spot. And then you don't stay there too long. You, you Just to, so they're aware of it, boom. Or if we're doing an IPP practice, this would be more like what I call IPP practice, where I'm only having a limited number of players. Yeah. And so really could you uh, um, explain the IPPs to people not knowing what IPP stands for? individual performance plan. So if we had a small group in and we're working with players, it, it's not individual by themselves on a coach. It's more these group of six players, here's our focus. And we're having our, what we would call maybe our complementary pairing. So we know that these are the three preliminary players that play a lot together. Let's put them in this, in this situation. Okay. Or I want to get my best six players some, practice where they're going to really work together on certain things because they can challenge each other. And then I bring my six other players in because i got to go slower with them. So we do a lot of that type of practicing now because when you teach to the average or to the middle, you get average. And so we really try to adapt it a little more. Yeah. Got it. Thank you, coach. Please continue. Uh, Diogo, my man. Thank you. Um, keep, keep guys, keep shouting feedback and, and everything you have there. Um, then the, the pensive, I think it's called, uh, it's, it's from Francesco. Uh, I've, I've been uh, like thinking about this drill for, for the whole summer. I think it was but just because I've, I've seen him doing that. And I think it's, it's really great and trying it now. Uh, I really like, I, I can, cannot say how many benefits this could bring. Uh, but basically, or uh, for the ones that don't know it, uh, one offensive player here, the passer, so he, he cannot score at this point. Um, the defender in the middle and an offensive player without the ball on, on the other side. So as soon as they go to this box here, yellow box, you can like limit by cones, whatever it is for that works for you. And then the, once they get this, the offensive player without the ball gets to this zone, he can choose where to go, uh, either that basket or this basket. Uh, first of all, this has like, I loved it just because in the beginning, they started to just go straight away because that doesn't require any effort, just going. And then they started to realize they would be open if they started to look at at their at the defenders that were in the play. Uh, this really, it was key for us to to do this at this point before talking about tra uh, offensive transition, just because one of our, our biggest points was running behind the defense if you can. And so talking first about the spatial awareness of where are the defenders rather than just how we want to run our, our transition or something like that, even though it's, it's, it's under 14, so it will be very basic. So it was really great. Um, and then um, obviously working on passing as well, that was our main focus. In the end, we would let everyone uh, pass as they could, uh, but obviously it would give extra points if they could pass with or off the dribble. Um, other thing that we actually did, so we, we would give points to uh, the assist and the, the, the made basket. Other ways that we tried to do was just giving more points if this player finishes without dribbling, just because that would promote probably a lot of step zero finishes and, and stuff like that. So a minor point inside this drill, but, but just so you know. And then loads. Um, Francesco has many more uh, uh, of these. These ones, these ones were the ones we tried. Uh, so adding one more defender and probably this defender is just closing a bit more because that will be harder for the timing. Um, and then, but again, playing on both sides. Uh, this obviously is harder for the ball handler just because he has a defender. Uh, we, here we would allow this player to score if he chooses the same. Uh, so 
whoever like the player without the ball has the power. So this is the one who has to choose which way we go. Uh, and then here, just on that um, on that basket now, uh, we'll add. So it's still two on one here, but then we'll add a third defender and his uh, and his def a third player and his defender, and he could go either weak side or ball side. Here, the goal the goal really is just to make sure. For example, if the defender if the player number three goes to the weak side, now probably we have to look for a helper in this situation. Uh, and so should should he make the pass or should, how late or how early should he make the pass? That's what the type of decisions that we are looking for. Um, and then here, uh, this, the same, uh, this was actually a great introduction for the two side fast break, but um, so we would, had, uh, we would put the ball in the intermediate, uh, intermediate uh, line, which is probably what we really want on, on in our transition. And then we'd had uh, here very basic. So first we did without this defender, and we just say it's, we just said for the ball handler to pass to the player ahead, the, the one that's closest to this basket. So that was actually very hard in the beginning, just because they weren't aware of that decision. Then we added one defender, and we actually did it until three on two, where a defender would start uh, on the on the three point line. So now it's much harder, and they have to really. To see where the space is, but taking a look at or, or being aware of the timing of that pass as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Rick, uh, Mike, I saw some questions here. I don't know if if we should if you want to stop it. Uh, no, I saw some question from Dan. Um, he was asking if uh, in this drill the offensive player chooses which basket he goes right, um, and Max already responded on that. So we okay. got a great coaching. Perfect. Everybody, <laughs> my bad. Then um, let's move on. Uh, so here again, passing window. So th this was really probably one of the, the biggest things is just trying to or, or avoiding as much as possible to work on uh, passing by by working on uh, on air drills. Uh, nothing wrong with just as as Coach Mike McKay said. We don't have enough enough time, so we tried to get something more realistic. So here probably you already seen this as well, but. The, the offensive player without the ball chooses uh, uh, which cone to go around before cutting to the basket, and the defender will chase him around the cone as well. So here, just a bit more about timing. We worked as well on the float dribble to open up the the angle of the pass. In the beginning, they struggled a lot because they would make this pass straight here, and obviously the, the angle is not so uh, uh, so good. Uh, just and obviously being being deceptive because the the defender is behind, so we will probably react to what the defender, the, the offensive player does. So uh, changing direction, changing speed, uh, some fakes, and we, we, we saw some great footwork and, and shoulder moves as well for that. So one more, one more pointing, one more point of, answer, of emphasis there. How we loaded it, so we, the first one was just to put a, a, one more defender for the ball handler, just to make it harder, really. We tried different ways of doing if the, if the defender should be behind or not uh, or, or from the, the ball handler. And I think it's just trying to find the sweet spot for them because it might be too hard to have the, the player um, in front. And then how it actually got a bit more interesting uh, was still the same start, but adding players in the corners. And now they only have, they actually have to look uh, for the help defenders knowing that this player will probably go a bit for the right side of, of the court. So they have to pay attention to what this defender number three will do. Maybe he will bump, maybe he will just stay attached. Uh, obviously, I think this, is, this could be a great progression for later on development on pick and roll stuff and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so again, uh, spatial awareness and good for us as well. We, we didn't have actually the, much time to do it, but what we would actually uh, work on because we, we were big on uh, single gaps and double gaps uh, uh, spicing and, and that concept. So if this guy cuts, then we probably have a double gap here or even a triple gap if the, if, if the player number one is here. So once we add a fourth defender on the ball handler, he can now attack the, the, the double gap or connect with the player number three to play some last cuts. 
And so that was a way as well to try to introduce in, in a game-like situation the blast code. Um, so, and now just to, to finish ways of working, how we worked on the, on the two sides fast break, uh, we worked on four, four and two in the beginning. So really trying to avoid just going four and four, four and zero for the sake of it. Um, so what we did was these players would be mixing around. So just going on a circle, whatever it is. Uh, and then the player, the, the coach would throw the ball to the backboard. Uh, would catch it and, and shout or something like that. So they, they'll have to open up the reference would be three point line. Or, well, actually for us was hugging the sideline. So we, in the beginning they had to touch uh, the sideline before going uh, or step the sideline. Um, and so really this, the, the coach would kick it out for, for some of the first line options for the, the outlet option. And then whoever doesn't have the ball has to run outside of these cones uh, just like in the first drills and then the ball handler is allowed to go middle if if he wants to, like we gave that freedom to the players and really the 10 second fast break just because as soon as the the coach outlets the ball they have 10 seconds to find the best the best shot uh we worked through videos as well on zoom calls what would look like uh, what the rub shot would look like um and so that was actually very beneficial um then how we loaded it obviously uh, until uh, to you will, if i three. may interrupt you um sure. as i think we all have the the rub shot from uh, the rob shot from somebody yeah. in this call as well mike could you elaborate a little bit on what you see and what you think is an rob shot range open balance and how would you introduce that slash what would define an rob shot for you well to me, to me, we would always introduce that uh, off court. We wouldn't spend time on court talking about. We would we would identify the all that stuff off court, especially with Zoom calls. Now it's amazing what you can do at a distance on that knowledge piece. But then on the court is whenever you're doing shooting drills, you're starting to make sure you're not shooting from stationary shots. You're letting players do what we would call range finder shots, where they they keep backing up. So if you make two in a row, you back up. You make two in a row. And so, and every time you can early in the season, you're doing range shooting drills to help them determine what the range is on their different types of shots. The balance one we'll do next. Well, balance to me is two things. It's your alignment and your rhythm of your shot. That's what we would call your, your shot form. So that's where we in IPPs would work a lot on the athlete's balance and their rhythm of their shot. You know, I always call it just preliminary action, your backswing force generation through a high release point. So working with them on that. The open one is relevant. It's relevant to who the player is and it's relevant to separation. So it's how much separation can they get and how do they get separation? Uh, the separation that a Diana Trossi needs to shoot compared to a U17 girl in Toronto, Nova Scotia is a whole lot different, but we have to help her understand that eventually you have to be able to find and, uh, what is really a separation for you. So when you do on-air shooting, you're never really practicing open. So it's making sure there's some kind of contesting going on is the only way you're going to find out what's being open. Perfect, Coach. Thank you. Um, Diogo, I think you were rounding it up, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, just finishing now. Actually, uh, Coach Mike, um, so one of the ways we worked on uh, the, the, like trying to, to, to make the translation of a rub shot means for the players, we used Zoom. Uh, I, I don't know if you've tried, but we used Kahoot, uh, the, like the, those little uh, surveys that you can do like in a competitive way. It actually worked great. So I don't, I don't know if you have tried that one, but uh, here's a, my little suggestion for, well, for we, the actual coaches love. Uh, uh, I have our, all of our age group players had to do, I called it was know your shot. So I gave them a template of how to break down their shot. So they all had to go in and some use, some use like uh, coach's eye, some use just iPhone videos, but they had to take a video of their shot from a game and break it down into what I call the different parts of the shot. And then they had to show some different shots. We showed them different shots and they had to analyze Rob for all these different NBA, WNBA players. And it was amazing to see how much they learned from doing that. 
The coaches said they wouldn't be able to do it. They said, oh, no, that's too hard. I said, no, no, it's too hard because you can't do it. I said, because you don't use the term. So I said, if we teach them the language, it's important that you teach them the language. They'll, they can do it. They're smarter than we think. We just don't make them smart because we don't talk in enough detailed language with them. And they blew it all the park. But I like that idea. I have to look into that a little more. I've seen it, but I haven't, I haven't used it myself. So, uh, yeah. so Mike, what, what would you think was the, the biggest, not really shock, but the biggest positive um, that one of the players came up with when you asked them to do that assignment? Well, they start to understand, especially the importance of their preliminary action to get them aligned so that they could have a backswing force generation. Too many of them shot in practice with a gun or the pass always coming straight out, straight out, straight out. And yet when they were in games, they didn't get that one. They usually had to move a little bit. There's a little bit of movement. And, and they had not worked on that little separation, that little movement into their backswing force generation enough so that in games, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't practicing the same shots they took in games. And the other one was that, and this I think is for girls especially, too many coaches, and the girls start to figure this out, too many coaches teach girls set shots when they're young. And then they just tell them to back up the shoot. Whereas, so they don't have enough power generation. So, so to me, we have to teach gir young girls jump shots from a younger age because you can't shoot, shoot a, a long set shot and be a good three-point shooter. And that's where a lot of girls struggle is because they've been taught set shots. And like I say, then the coaches tries to make them back up. Well, they have no, they have no rhythm in their force generation. So those are the two big things that we get over. Yeah, no, indeed. So um, before we go on to Amanda's question, I would like to ask if Diogo could finish up uh, his presentation yeah. before going to Paul. Then we can uh, ask the question from Amando. Um, yeah, as bad. it's not so really... I'll, I'll finish this now. Um, yeah. So then we moved on uh, four and three, and this one was actually much, much, very much more interesting, just because we could break down the reads that they could have. So if no one is playing defense on the ball handler, then they could drive very easily for them to see that. And then uh, if, let's say, one defender is on the ball, uh, and then the other two defenders are on the weak side, then we have an extra uh, a pass to the corner uh, that will be an open shot for, for almost every one of them. So that was easy. And then if they are being defended, uh, we just try to, to find the 2 on one on the weak side. So that does why we use 10 seconds, because if we give them 15, that would be too much. And they will start to, to not being real. Um, but yeah, uh, obviously, then we pass to 4 and 4 But just before that, if we got many players, I actually try to use as well 4 and 4 um, on the off-court line. So we would, the coach would call out one player to touch the off-court line and then coming back. Again, this is just not so much as the fast break, but just to try to find the, the open shot uh, uh, at some point. Uh, and they started to apply some of the ghost cuts as well in some, in some situations. And then four and four, this was actually very interesting because we, we could actually finish the, the drills, the, the sessions with this one. So we'd start, we would make some of these progressions, not, not necessarily through all of them, uh, but then going four and four there. So with, with the, the coach start here uh, of the, the rebound, and then we'll go four trips. Uh, and then we added whoever wins the four, um, the, the four trips could stay on into the next one. So again, by the end of it, it was actually a, a lot of conditioning for, for them too. So yeah, that's, that's it, uh, um, Mike. No, perfect, man. Um... So, Mike, we got a question in the chat saying, how do you teach the 1v1 defense when the ball is inbounded? Which technique and body position do you teach? So to uh, have one hand pressure the inbounds pass, but not allowing a pass over the head of the defender. Um, I noticed my under-14 team is really struggling with that. Is, is that for me or for Michael? Oh, oh, my bad. I, I already muted myself. No, I, uh, Mike, could you help help us out with this one? I like to, I'd like to hear Diego, Diego's first. All right, let's go, Diego, man. <laughs> well, I won't be biased. No, uh, what our emphasis was uh, trying to be on the on a close denial. Um, so, one hand on the on the on the ball 
on the ball line, on, on the passing line, so our outside hand, and then the reference for that not to happen, if I understood correctly, for no, no back doors or over the head passes, uh, would be to be in a stance where, not necessarily with contact, but where my foot closer to the basket would be between, be, would be closer to the basket than my defender. So by that, controlling a bit the distance and not allowing that, that back door. Uh, and so yeah. To elaborate so, on that, how would you teach that? Because that's something that's, that's like really, really pointing out like my feet has to be in between the defender, or sorry, the offensive player in the basket. I still want to have yeah. my outside so, hand denying the, the inbound pass. So how would you teach that? Or how would you make that a teaching point for kids that they have like key triggers you can say? For, for, for us, the positioning part uh, was really, our cue was obviously if you are looking at both ball, so a midpoint between the ball and our uh, offensive player, it would be that we have to be closer to the basket than our, our player. So in that way, you, you end up by having your closest foot closer to the basket than, than the offensive player. And then just a, a matter of trying to, to have the, your, your harm there. Uh, but rather than that, we didn't focus that, like not that much, but we wouldn't give many more cues than that. I hope right, that makes perfect. sense. I'm bad, my bad. To, to me, it's, I would never teach just one way because I want my offense to learn to see different ways to learn how to attack. And the problem I, I've always found with defense is, is we, I mean, look, when I grew up, it was always, everybody had coached like Bobby Knight and there's only one way you play defense, but your, your team only got good at attacking that defense because that's what they did every day in practice. So I learned very quickly that I want to teach, I teach four things that, if I'm defending the ball out of bounds. One, we can be what we call is, uh, we can be in what we call catcher, which is right up on the ball pressuring. And then the other person is in the same denial that Diego's talking about. The second one we would be is a shortstop where I'm turning, I'm face guarding the, the person. So we're almost double teaming the person to the main receiver. So anytime a team just has one person back, we're going to run a shortstop. We're going to come up and double that and force another person back into the play. And then the third one, we're going to play like a right field or a left field, which is we get off the inbounder and we stand like a shadow so the person can't cut long. And then in the final one, we're going to play center field where the person guarding the person receiving face guards, and I play deep center field and take away any pass over the top. So any any one-on-one -on -one drill, we would always start with an inbounds normally or off a rebound. I would never start somebody in a court with a ball and say, okay, play, because that doesn't happen. So... I get a chance to practice a defensive and inbound every single one of those drills. And I'll, if I can get six turnovers off of that, awesome. But I also want six times that my offense learns to throw over the top, right? So, because those are, those are what wins you the gold medal. Like if we're, gonna, we're trying to get into the medals at the Olympics, we need six of those things. We need six. That's all we need to get our shooting percentage up to high enough to win those games. So, it, it, a lot of times that's not coming from your half court offense and your half court sets and deep. It's, it's coming from those type of situations. So anytime you can practice that randomness of that type of defense, I think it's a great thing to help build decision-making in your players and this deception and disruption. Yeah. I think you, you had a great, uh, and also great analogy is going to the, uh, to the baseball stuff. Um, and I was already thinking about stuff in, in, in our practices as well that we build on scenarios in which the defender is a passer or that the pass comes from the, the next spot on. And it's not really starting with a game-like scenario as we speak, um, because in, in game, never, it would never happen that the defender will make you the pass and run the close out because that would be insane. As well as you being able to catch a, like a, a chess pass coming from a screen with that right alignment and already set for a shot because you don't have the right, um, the right balance yet during the game. Could you have like one or two triggers to yeah, make that more random or make that more, more game-like and decision-making on, on such kind of drills? Well, what I would do, like this is a, an early season drill. What I would do is we're playing one-on-one. -on -one, and if you picture the, the basketball court, and divide it across this, the foul line at each end. 
and then go down the, the, the um, foul lane, you end up with 12 grids, right? Does that make sense? You end up with 12 grids, four yeah, down six, the sides. Yeah, six, yeah, six, yeah. Six, 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 it's the same for the ref. It's the same ones the referees use for their refereeing. Yeah, exactly. Referee. Yeah, got it. So, so what we will do is we will play in groups of three. We play one on one around the court on slobs and blobs, and you and then they got to determine which basket they're scoring at. But now that defender and offensive player have to think, okay, how do I get an advantage in this? And then, and then we tell the, the person guarding, you can either face guard or you can play. You play any way you want. But now the offensive player is like, well, where do I want to position myself in that grid based on if they're fronting me? Well, to me, I'm going to take you as close to the pass or inbounding to give me space over the head. If you want to play behind me, I'm going to get as far away and now give me more space to cut into. Well, that's the, the thinking I want the players to learn is how do I start to read this space and now the offensive players have to read the same thing. You know, so it, those little decisions of understanding how to manipulate space are, are so important. And then yeah. all I do is I start to load in, okay, now we now call it Kawhi in Canada. Okay, you're playing Kawhi, you got 4.8 seconds. In your grid, you got 4.8 seconds. That's what's on the shot clock. Win the, win the championship against Philadelphia. Kids love it. So you play you play one on one in that same grid that one one twelve. You have four? to catch it. You have to catch it in that grid. And you that's the only restriction. You, you got to catch it in the grid. Yeah, you predetermine you determine, which grid you want to catch it. Or yeah, but then but then they got to declare which is the basket. So I can say that one or that one. After the so catch. Now the defender's like, oh, that's the basket. I'm going to do this. Oh, that. And now they get to decide. Right. So, so after and, the catch, they decide basket or they decide. No, basket? no, you, you decide before the ball's inbounded. You okay. just declare it, that the person just that's that's our basket we're scoring at. So now yeah. the defense decides. Okay, well I'm playing you here then. Well then the offense tries to say, well then I if I I'm going to move you to that spot there so I have more space to cut into. The yeah. the kids at the start they'll start right in the center every single time. Well, no, use your space. No, true, true indeed, true indeed. Um, time wise, I would like to go on with with Paul. Paul, are you willing to share your part of the tonight's round one. I think you're still muted, uh, Paul. It's a good speech, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, hi, guys. Um, I'm, I'm doing defensive concepts. So I guess this is a, an area that I've kind of over the past few years, I've tried to develop really to to make the situation where I'm coaching in sound bites um, and terminologies. So this is kind of like our defensive terminology sheet for the national team. And we kind of have defensive spot terminology and actually the action terminology. And in a while, I'll talk about how we code certain phases in terms of underneath side out of bounds, offense and defense. So we'll talk about that in a second, but a couple of things to be aware of. Um, so hoop position is, and we'll talk about that and I'll show a grid in a second, but the hoop position is, is that charred circle underneath the, the rim. So we call that the hoop position. Um, the high side and the close out. So where we're trying to force um, and things like that. Momentum space. So, so a lot of people call it more air space. We like to call it momentum space. Because if we give too much space, that's the momentum space where the offense can retreat dribble back and get more momentum space. Or if we're too far off, they can push off their heels to get more momentum space. So we'd like to call it, take away the momentum space as opposed to take away the air space. So we can identify that's where they get their momentum for. Defending two, stopping two. Uh, so obviously the closeout is one of the hardest defensive skills to teach. One of the hardest to, um, to stay in to take away the momentum space. So we try, and in the last couple of years, try and let the defenders understand that we're trying to be back in front of the offense within two dribbles. So we call that defending two. On the weak side, we want no hugging. So literally being on top of your guy. And then obviously defensive ball screen coverages, we, we give them names through, which is the aggressive hedge, blitz is trapping, flat is the, is the mid drop on the nail. Ice, obviously we all know jam is where the, the forward jams the other forward and, and we go two under, which is not really what we what we like to do, but it's against a, a poor defender who's a good penetrator. We try and do that. 
Next thing everybody's beginning to learn about, 88 is our switch. And it's one of our terminologies because when you switch 88, it's still 88. So that's what we want to try and do. Um, and then a wall. So we want to defend as a wall. So we give anal analogies all the time of if you're being chased, would you rather see a pole or would you rather see a wall? So like obviously if you're being chased, you'd want to see narrow stuff. If you're being chased, the last thing you want to see is a wide thing where you have to stop your striding and regain momentum. So we always want to say we're a wall defensively. In terms of uh, defensive actions, close out, catch up step, stunt and recover, peel switch. The one thing that we'll sp speak about in a while is heels outside the lane where we want to try and meet to make that a contested mid-range jumper. Um, and then our numbers, and we'll talk more about that in a while in terms of what a single digit means, a double digit means, what a zero digit means. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, our offensive spots, but these are our defensive spots. So right here, you're going to see the hoop position, um, where we, the three arrows, where we want to try and keep people out of the lane. I was always very, very much, especially uh, pr prior to the last two years of forcing end line, forcing end line, forcing end line. Now I'm at a point of the, there's too many good athletes. As long as we keep them out of the dome, we're fine. But if we get beat middle, we want to get them above that nail so we don't get caught on a dome touch. Ideally, we want to force them back to where we call the point pipe, which is what we show in a second. But yes, yeah, so we still want to try and ideally get our traps in that corner area, getting our heels outside the lane, which is another terminology. But if we get beat middle, we want to make sure we're we're defending in two and we're not getting beaten two. And that's a prime thing for us. In terms of transition, we are never on a ball, on a middle penetration, we never come off the, the sideline because we feel we get more exposed there. And we'll talk more about that in a second. I just got to stop sharing there a second, Mike, get the video. Um, no problem, man. Let us see the video. There we go. All right. So I hope this works and it's not stunting as much. So what we say to youth development concepts, it's really kind of building towards when they're senior basketball players. So we will deal in half court terminology and clips, pressing videos and how, showing some videos of the same guys playing senior basketball um, in the last couple of years. And then some drills at the end of it that we kind of utilize. And I guess my whole practice has changed and Michael probably know Dawn Smith she came to Ireland a number of years ago and she gave the phases that they do. And I know defensively and offensively that they, they do them a little differently, but I kind of brought them into the same, whereas offensively it's phase A, phase B, phase C, phase D. And then I think defensively, Mike, you do one, two, three, and four. I like to keep the phases the same. So we still try and do phase A, B, C, and D defensively. So we call it teaching defense and then teaching offense. So I don't call it scripted or guided. I like to say that we're actually using it as a teaching defense and a teaching offense. So that's something that we try and, we try and do there. Um, so coding phase of the basketball. So one of the things that we try and do here is to try and keep the, the mental side of the game down for the kids is off offenses if we are using schemes, which we don't really do on, until they get to 16. But if we're using underage or over 14s, we try and give them names. So like maybe Illinois, Chicago, whatever it is. Um, side out of bounds, we try and use colors. Underneath, we try and use body parts. And then defense, we try and use numbers. And that way then, at least if the kid is in the, in the arousal of a game, at least they know, even if they're in the wrong spot, at least they know what they're going to. So either defensive, side out of bounds, underneath an offense. And that's just a small little thing that we, we try and do to kind of keep the pressure off the, the kids as much as we possibly can. In terms of our phases, um, what we're trying to do here. So when I said the numbers, anything single digit is a half court. So five is man to man. Two might be a two, three zone. Three is a three, two zone. One might be a one, three, one. Um, all that sort of stuff. So single digit is a half court defense. Full court is a double digit. So 55 is a full court man to man. Um, 55, 88 is full court switching. Uh, if we go 13, that's a full court, 131, et cetera, et cetera. So anything double digit is full court. And anything zero is a trapping defense. So if we go 50, that's a full court man run and jump. So anything with a zero, zero being a circle and a trap, 
So again, it's, it's a small analogy that we try and do just to try and keep the kids um, a little bit more understanding of what we're trying to do. So I spoke earlier about the point pipe. So I try and teach our offense that we're always on defense at the same time, that if we end up making an error, that we can recover it pretty quickly. So as you can see right now, the guy in the ball, number four, this was in 2015 out in Copenhagen. So number four, he's on the wing. And the guy setting the screen leaves everything open here. So if we turn the ball over here, we're in big trouble right now. So number six here is supposed to come off the screen and come back to that center point, which is rim to rim. Um, and that's called what we call the pipe. So every, we, we don't really encourage strong side, weak side passes. We want to try and make sure that we're always in a situation where we're at least giving a strong side, strong side pass. So if number six falls short to the pipe, he's on a strong side, weak side pass. And that's stealable. And we never want our passes to be stealable. Number nine, we need to force number nine to either play us, be late, be early. And if he's early, we can cut back door. So from an offensive perspective, we're still playing defense because if six doesn't come up here, we're in trouble. And look at what happens here. So he never came. We end up turning the ball over and look at the gap between four and six. And that's what we want to try and avoid. So we're Luckily, we threw all bounds, which now allows us our defense, but we'd have been giving up two points if that didn't happen. Four areas of the half-court defense. Passing lane, these are the four key areas we want to try and teach underage. Passing lanes, defending two, and keep the gate closed. What we mean by keep the gate closed, and we'll show a clip here in a second, where, we, where kids open the hips to try and get back the block, we call that opening the gate, and that's where trouble happens. So we want to keep that gate closed, so we're always forcing the offense to be passive, whether it's with the ball or passing, and be lateral as much as we possibly can. Heels outside the lane is a huge one, and then 88, which is switching defense. I truly believe that switching defense allows us to be in situations where traditional forwards can guard guards, and guards can guard, guard forwards. And if we're really interested in developing young athletes to be senior basketball players, they have to be able to guard on the perimeter, and they have to be guard interior. So switching for me, provided it's done right. So our teaching concept for 88 is one must be high and one must be low. So if you're taking the switch, if you're switching onto the guy receiving, you're the high guy. If you're the guy being screened, your job is to get lower than the screener to prevent the slip. So essentially, we're always trying to force a flare, which is a difficult pass to make in my, in, in my eyes at that level. So they're the re, they're, that's why I think switching could be really important. So, so the pass... Uh, well, for, the switching, for the switching part, you won't let your big, like your five switching as you're talking about guards and forwards. So you will keep your five in a drop coverage or how would we see that? Um, I'll show some clips here in a, in a while, um, okay. Mike. On switching, it'll be around halfway in. But like if obviously we might, we might go 88, one through four. or So that means our five, one switch. Um, we might go 88, one, two, three, one, two, and three. And we might go 88, four, and five. So fours and fives can switches and one, twos and threes can switches. But anything guard forward, we may not switch. And then if we've got five forward or five guards, we may go 88, one through five. So that will all determine on the lateral the ability, lateral defensive ability of, of the kids and whether we foresee that they're going to have potential of being a guard long term as well. So those things will, will, will determine that. So this is a very simple one on the back door. Now, here's something I think that we always try and tell our kids. Some people will teach what we call opening the chest. So right now in the corner, actually this is against um, Alan, no, this is later on I'll show against Alan Keane's team, but in the corner here now, so our, our one is actually our five man and he's quite competent in, in guarding the perimeter. And you'll see here at the point pipe area where the defender turns his head to the ball and swings his right arm up in the passing lane. And we call that the, the old grandfather, grandfather pendulum, you know the one that the grandfather clock? So we call that a grandfather pendulum. So we, we, we don't mind losing the ball for a split second with the back of the head, provided that his eyes are back on his fingertips again pretty quickly. Rather than opening his chest and not knowing where, the, where, the, where his offensive player is going to be, I'd rather see where the offensive player is. Right now, all our four players are in decent passing lanes. We're pressuring the ball, and therefore we're causing, and we're getting that passing lane, and now we're out in transition. Same here again. So on the screen on the right side here, or uh, right over here, Tiernan is coming off that screen. We, Because we're all in passing lanes, we are now making the offense. Now the pressure on the ball isn't great, but we're just making the, the offense coming off screen a little bit tentative. 
he tries to jump on the switch, we continue through, and then we end up getting out in that. But passing lanes is the first thing, and we constantly talk about passing lanes. Um, here you're going to see, and this is the first time where you're going to see the gate being opened. Same player. So now, right now, we're in decent passing lanes. We got the long, the, the corner out here, corner out here. He's got him covered. He's got him covered here. CJ has got covered here and Sammy's in the corner here. We're fairly dispersed, so we're hugging a little bit. But right now, Paul has the gate closed. The next step is huge. So what happens now? Paul opens the gate. This forces Dave here to come in. And he loses his passing lane because he has to overhelp because Paul opens the gate. So opening the gate and the passing lane, to me, are the two most important things defending early on. So now all of a sudden we're in a bad peel, you could say, and we give up a foul and a three. So defending in two and keeping the gate closed. So same situation. Let's go back here a split second. So again, ball screens, we tend to switch early in the program. Obviously, we'll advance it as we progress through the program. But as you can see, well, you can't hear, but Ronan is speaking to, to Matt. But look at the first step of Matt, Matt Harper here. He goes up over the screen. He doesn't allow himself to be screened, and he's able to defend in two. And that's a huge thing for us. We have a stunt on the weak side from Tiernan, and now Ronan is in the mid-drop, and he's going to recover here. James in the passing lane, and so do we have a Paul over here. But because of that now, we are in a situation where we force an, a long, long three, and we're good with that because we did the first step in terms of defending in two. Here again, we're late, but we got back in two. And we end up getting, I think, a contentious one, but we got it in the end. Again, here, we get above the screen and we're defending in two. We're staying and we're keeping our chest in turn. Just to answer a, call, a question a while ago in terms of staying in front, one of the things that we teach an awful lot right um, here, we kind of opened the gate, we didn't get back. But in terms of on ball, we want our sternum in line with the dribbling shoulder. And that's right through the whole way. So our sternum must be in line with the dribbling shoulder. And that allows us to establish our feet based on where the ball is rather than having to be in the same position the whole time. We defend in two. And that's our five defending a three. So that's Dara. Again, now we are in a situation where our two is guarding a two. And we defend in two. And we end up getting the steal. Pressuring the lanes. Again, this is our five defending. And we force a, a kick out. And we get there in a closeout and we end up winning it. All because we're defending in two. This one here, we switch. We defend in two. We keep the gate closed. And then we end up getting a peel switch. And we're out in transition again. This one here, we're playing Georgia. We defend in two. And now we're taking a, they're taking a contested shot. We're all out and running. And we get an uncontested three in transition. Very next possession, we do the very same. They're trying to get it back on us. And we end up pushing it again off of a rebound. They're in a long closeout and they open their gate and now we get an, an easy layup at the rim. So keep being the gate closed. Now, this is where I've tried to improve as a coach because I think I was always so stringent on it. I still am to a certain degree about not letting go middle, but now I'm at a point where defending middle is so hard, we're kind of isolating it where you must defend in two and Tierney did a decent enough job there. We ice it. We allow it here. I think we did a poor job in letting that kick out here, but I think we just a little bit. So now we're up again, and we get an uncontested three. We force them to overhelp, and then we score on the other end. So I think it's all about us. Two things early on: the passing lanes and defending in two, where we need improvement again here. So Paul gets caught in the screen, which now means that we've opened the gate. And the second gate is open because our five opens his gate right here. And now we end up having our four having to stay in and we end up giving a kick out because we opened two gates, a third gate, and there we're in. So we didn't defend in two in any one of those situations and we end up getting it. Third thing that we try and teach really well is heels outside the lane. I truly believe that they're even the smallest distance of about three or four inches. If you're feet are halfway over the lane or the block line as opposed to being full that two or three inches gives a closer uncontested shot so we're adamant on making sure that our heels are outside the lane first one here we open the gate the help is coming help is coming from here look at where james is 
he is, his heels are outside the lane. And he opens with a chest. Yes, he takes contact, but he gets bumped back. And now it's a contested shot at the rim. And we end up getting a block and a run out. Here, obviously, zone we don't, we don't try and encourage. But it's also the very same in situation of a zone. So we just try to hear against Denmark. And again, because he's early and heels outside the lane, it psychologically forced the offense to stay wide. We end up pressuring it, and we end up getting a late steal just here, and we end up getting a run out because we forced a contested poor pass. Where it needs improvement, you're going to see some drastically poor defense here. So it's all about the head turn. So if we get the situation here, we open up. Look at the amount of back of the heads. So from an offensive perspective, one of our guidelines is if you see the back of a head, we want to cut or we want to attack. Right now, we're not in the heels outside the lane. We're poor visually, and now we end up getting scored on the rim. So that's why it's a huge point for us. Very same thing here. No heels, easy layup at the rim. And they expose us poorly on it. Here, we have the very same thing in transition. We want to meet them heels outside the lane and turn them back in to the trailing defenders. It's a little bit differently from the half court. I thought we got unlucky here in this one. This was just a scrimmage game that we had prior to lockdown. Um, I thought we were unlucky in that one. In terms of our 88, I think it's very important. I think here you're going to see exactly what you're talking about here, what you were talking about here, Mike. Our first switch is going to be over here. So we see where we get high here. So Ole McCann is high. James gets low. Next switch. He's high. He, Dara is trying to get under the defender to make sure that he's low and not get slipped. Third switch, right? Dara goes low. Dave's going to come high. So we're still in those passing lanes. We got, and this, when Dara didn't get below the screen, we got slipped here. But look at his recovery. He's trying to fight underneath it. And now we end up defending in two. We open the gate, but look where the heel's coming outside the lane is coming. And we end up getting a contested shot. So we made one half mistake, which forced on the weak side not to do a good job. Here we get another bunch of switches. Look at Dave going high, James getting low. This is the switch here. So now Dave is going low and James is coming high and we end up getting the seed and we're going to run out. Pressure D. To me, there's half court pressure and there's full court pressure. So here we're going to see the same thing here. Now we get a bit of this. We're affecting passing names. We're Forcing here, we scramble, but then we force it. We're in the passing lane on the weak side, and we get a steal. Our phraseology for this is we want to force a rainbow pass. Stupid little thing, rainbow pass. At the bottom of the rainbow is gold. We, so if we force a rainbow pass, we're going to get the gold, and we're going to get run out. Silly little phraseology that we have. Same thing here. We trap off the second ball screen, and we get a deflection because we're, we're pressuring the passing lane. Full court pressure, man to man. One of the things we try and do is we try and start a little bit high. Right? And on the switch, here you go again. We're trying to get in the high side. We ideally want to force the lob going over the top and steal it on the second line if we can. Dave did a very poor job here of connecting and taking away the passing lane. But Paul did a really good job here. Now, one of the things that we want to do in the pressing is we want to create blind spots. So as James comes here, Dave should have been here so that he could have replaced. And then we say the seer switches. So in this situation here, right, Dave is still tagging. He did the poor job here. But now we get to the flexion. Here we go to the point pipe again. Look at what Dave does. So we're in defense right away by getting to the point pipe. We spaced out, and there we got to the point pipe on that, affecting our defense, our offense. And now we're attacking. He opened, and, and we get a foul off the press. This is it. So Paul, we, we, we got uh, a question coming in. Is the Hills outside lane um, an instruction for the help side defender or more for the on-ball defender? How help. does this principle help exactly defender. work? Help side defender. And then when we get that across, um, when we get the heels outside the lane, the weak side drops to the hoop position. Amanda, if that asks, uh, if that uh, answers your question, uh, please let know in the chat. I, I, I know Diogo has a question, so fire it away, Diogo. Oh yeah, Paul. Just maybe I didn't understand it, but so you pill switch when whenever you cannot recover. Just want to know what's your what's your cue for the players to know if they can or cannot recover. Yeah. So 
when we cap every trap, we try and get into a man to if they pass out of our trap, we go into man to man automatically. So, I mean, I mean on, on uh, man to man defense, so without the traps, without the without so the seer switches. So, if we if both our defenders' heads are turned, it's the passer out the seer switches. So, if you and I were to trap, if I could find one here in a second, uh, boom, right? So, we got a trap here now. Here's what would happen. If the ball went back here, so if number seven passed back towards the rim, James is the low side, he'd be the switcher because he can see. Tiernan's back of the head can't see, so uh, James would switch. If seven was to pass to, this, to the taller guy coming here, James is back of the head, which is this guy here, he wouldn't be able to switch because he can't see. So Tiernan would switch. So we say the seer switches on the peel switch. Okay, and, and ju just one thing then, on, on half court, when do you so th that's exactly my question how do players know that they they should uh pill switch and and, and just switch on that stunt or like w what's the difference for for that so we actually have a terminology for for peel switching but if if it's a trap that's when we automatically peel switch so if we're not in traps we we will have a different code for for that so it's not okay. it's not part of our defense and that I have a drill at the end that I, that I show real quick. So now, here, so you see the way James, Tiernan actually switched wrong here because he wasn't the seer. So if we go back here a second, so the ball came back to the rim, nine should have actually been where seven is. So that was actually a poor exchange there, but we ended up getting away with it and getting the foul on that. Um, that's off. Now, I made a point later on. When we, when we, when we were pressing, we have our guards in on the free throw line. We actually don't put our forwards in. So when we switch or when we press, we put our forwards in, in in the key because on a miss or a make, we actually want our guards to be in position to get traps. So one of the things, that's a thing that we really, um, we really do a really good job of, um, whether it's zone press or whether it's man-to-man -man press, we stick our two guards in the key to, um, to be in the press regardless of whether we make or miss. So as you can see, we make it and now we're, we know where we're at. We end up getting a switch here. You saw Rap push one of our players there into position. And that's where we, we, anytime there's a rainbow pass, we allow a gamble because the ball is slow in the air. So they threw a rainbow pass and we end up scoring this on the buzzer. Just before half time. Again, we try and get that trap off the first pass. Now, again, that was a poor uh, switch because really Paul Kelly should have... So now here, this might answer your question in terms of the traps. Four should have switched, not five. So with four switching, he can see. And number five should have stayed with 32. But instead, it was poor communication. And now you see our number five, his gate is opened. And really that Georgian point guard should have really taken advantage of us more on that situation. CJ recovers. And I didn't like that possession because of the fact that CJ gave too many chances for his gate to be opened. And we end up affecting passing lanes again on this one. This is full court. So we get beat out of the trap here. We're now in like what we call a catch-up step. So any time that we get beat, we abandon all old school philosophies and we call it a catch-up step. And you're sprinting to a spot, not a man. So right now, this player here should be sprinting to the halfway line, trying to get him back to slow him down. But the guy in the ball is just, and there we go. But he never got in front of him as much as we would have liked. So we're switching, defending two. Again, switching, defending two, and that's our five on their three. And that allows us then getting a run out on this one. In a bit of a pressure one, so this is a 2-2-1. Two, two, we peel the second a little bit. So our ideologies on a 2-2-1 on a two, two, is anything in the middle, the second line comes to the middle and the first line peels off in behind. So as you can see here, and then we end up getting the steal on that. You'll see here in a second, the ball's kicked out. Look what we are, right here in the point pipe. So we're on defense, even though we're on offense, making sure that we're not getting exposed um, in transition in case we turn it over. Off of a three-point make in the corner. Now we're into a 12. So again, 12 is a full court. It's a double digit. And then we're trying to get into a situation where we get a trap. 
and we're in all passing lanes to force rainbow passes um, from there again. So just a couple of things in senior, the support, sorry, my fault. So these are the same kids that are playing senior, that's played senior and transitioned the same skill set into senior basketball. Poor heels, easy score at the rim. Next one is the good heels. So these are twins, 18 years old, playing senior basketball, good heels. We end up getting a run out because of it. And they were actually one of the champs. So here we get beat. We open the gate. Did a poor job on that one. And here the same player defends in two and stays up front. These are young players playing senior basketball. Again, we defend in two, and that was the champions the year before. This is our press. Now, a while ago we saw we trapped on this. So one of our phrases is we want to create a blind trap. So in order for that to happen, it means that the inbound guy needs to stay. If the inbound guy cuts the middle, we won't be able to get that first trap. So we follow it through. But we're trying to create a blind scenario where we can get that trap from behind. Or a rainbow pass, and then we drop and we get into the passing lanes. So fundamentally, the passing lanes is transferred from underage basketball into the senior. We hit the point pipe, get a back cut, and there we get into the dunker spot on a cut from our pressing. So we really try and emphasize that. Coming to the end now, fellas. So phase A, we want to teach the close or making sure that we're just defending the closeout and the first step. So that's how we would teach in this, an exchange drill. So we're stance in the middle, and then we go the opposite side. Again, we're defending the first dribble. These are all 13 and 14 year old kids. So Paul, I've already got a question on this one because this is a, a, a topic we are also discussing within the academy is on how to do the closeout because you see them all make that study step, but isn't it much better to do a hockey stop, like a one, two stop, bam. I think, I think it's, it's, I think at that age, and this was early last year. This is actually an old clip. I think if I was doing this now, I'd probably cue what type of shooter that they are in a phase A scenario. Because now they need to learn how to react with their feet based on the fact of what type of shooter that they're coming up against or a penetrator. So now I might say, um, you know, shooter. So they got maybe belly up and then work on their first step recovery is what we would call it, or defending two on the shooter that puts the ball on the floor. I might say a non-shooter, so now it's that short, choppy step and be tentative. I think I would do this, diff this drill differently now based on what I would know now in terms of cueing the phase A as opposed to just going through. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense, man. Thank you. So now the advancement of this drill, so you saw three lines a while ago. We normally start with just a closeout, exchange, closeout. Now we're phasing A again by bringing the weak side into the help position. So the same three lines, we have a help position on the weak side. Um, and then we exchange. And then we would end up making that team that just closed in. They'll go close out on the weak side again. So again, we're getting that weak side. Then we exchange. And see how they're closing out on the other side? So they get two sets of closeouts now. One is on no defender and one is on a defender because we only use three lines. But again, I would cue that if we were doing that now. And here you go again. I didn't realize that section was so long. My apologies. All right. So now, I wouldn't do that drill with a senior team. This is a drill that we do quite a bit. This is only this new team. We call this Florida. Four closeouts. It's a communication. Again, we cue it on the recovery. So right now, there's four, a straight line in the middle. One, two, three, and four. So one has got to go to the back, become four in the next one, up to three, up to two. So they get four closeouts on all four spots. Um, they quite enjoy this because at the beginning, someone always screws up and we, we have a bit of a banter with this. But as you can see, all four players are exchanging. So we will call th four, uh, three, two, one, and on zero, they got to recover. So they got to stay on the closeout until they hear zero. And all four players, and we're, it's just a bit of a communication. Now, 
this is where we become phase C and we call this dragonfly. And the kids love it, even the 18 year olds love it. So basically you have a, the dragonfly is in the middle, the top guy is the protector and the two guys in the middle are also the protectors and the back guy is the, is the, is the light. So the ball has to hit the, the dragonfly's tail. So we're working on recovery, we're working on closeouts, we're working on communication, we're working on help, we're working on foot reaction. The kids absolutely love it. So we gotta protect the back. So obviously there's a lab pass, we gotta recover the whole time. And we obviously had three or four groups going at any one time. So you can see, even the passing, they're trying to be a bit more accurate. The bigger kids weren't as good, I'm afraid. So that was, a, that was a bit of fun that day. Um, and as you can see, the confusion. So there is a bit of connectedness going on that they have to work on a bit of teamwork. So as you can see the top guy is working and you gotta hit the back guy and it's a bit of fun. Sometimes you can make the line a bit longer, a bit wider. So now this is kind of the game, this is the phase C where we kind of put in from one on zero to two and to, sorry, uh, one on one to two and two to three on three. So we're working on that heels. There you go, that's your heels. Now we're kicking out, we're working on the closeout and now we're playing. I find that the biggest challenge for young players is to play two and two with five on five in mind. The easiest thing for two and two players to do is to just go trap number six and, and give them one outlet. What we see here with Dara, so now we're defending in two with Wede. Dara holds his passing lane. And now Wede has to make a choice. Does he stay in help or does he stay in the passing lane? And that's the defensive decision making that we're looking at. So the same drill, now we're playing two and two again. Working on the pro stop, same thing here. So this is the peel switch. This is how we practice our peel switching then in terms of that stuff then, Diogo. So it was a little bit late in that one, but so now the seer. So number eight is the seer. He's the guy that makes the peel switch and it was a poor closeout. We change it up a little bit. We're passing back to the wing on this one instead of the top. And now we're just creating a different, we lose the passing lane. So this is a horrible situation on how we lose a passing lane. Now we're in three on three. So now we're working on screens. We have to do, are we switching? Are we staying with the cutter? Are we staying with the backdoor cutter? And then obviously how we're, how we're um, rebounding. Three on three again. How are we defending the screen? We're switching and that's where a poor switch happens. So as you can see, so we switch high, the guy is switching onto the high, but to the low defender never switched inside him and that's where the slip happened. So that's something that we would, we'd work on that. And then he gets caught in a situation like that. Defending two, no need for the heels if we're staying in front. So that's the timing issue as we get older that we need to work on in order to figure out when do we become the heels guy? Does our on-ball defender have enough time to stay in our defending in two and they're all the things that we just practice in a three and three a one on one or sorry one on one two and two three and three and that's the type of drill that we would build that we would layer the same thing on i think we got a question from uh oh diogo is sending it yeah, to me um, do they switch if there isn't contact yeah just Switch absolutely everything, even no contact. And at the beginning, it is messy. It is frustrating. There's arguments. And then we try and figure, we get them to figure out what are we actually switching on? What is the point where the switch happens? And you saw it against Portugal with Dave Murray, there was actually an actual cut and we still switched it. So therefore we switch everything. So that takes away the confusion um, for, for us. So um, as we're going into our um, stoppage time, as we could say it in, uh, uh, could say it out here, I want to uh, ask both Paul and, and, and Mike uh, a question on this one. Is uh, you mentioned that the two and two is is really hard to teach when you have to imagine five on five scenarios. So would both of you, um, for example, limit the space the offense can attack in? So for example, they can only attack to the other side of the, the bucket lines and not cross that side? Or let's start with Paul, would you limit that space or how would you still let them think that they play five, five, five and five and not stepping on somebody else's foot? We, um, we don't limit the space. We, we, keep the, we keep the half court because it means that they have to either play out of a trap, they have to play isolation one-on-one, -on -one, defend one-on-one. -on -one. 
Whereas if we limit it, they're always going to have some form of help. So we, so we just find that not taking away the space, but staying playing five and five principles. So like if we want to defend one pass away in the passing lane, that's the way we want to do it. If we want to double team it, then you got to go all out and leave your guy open for an uncontested look. Even though that might not happen in a five and five, because we will get the rotation to help on that guy. But we got to make sure that we, we, we stick with what we're trying to teach in a five and five. So if it works in a two and two, it's going to work in a five and five. And that's our kind of thing. If it works two and two, it's going to work five and five. All right, perfect. Mike. Well, again, it depends on the intent. What, what's the intent we're trying to get from the offense and defense? And if, if we're getting what we want, I'm not putting any restrictions in, but if all of a sudden they're cheating the drill, we're very quickly we'll restrict whatever we have to restrict just just to make sure we're getting the intent of what we want so if we're just running uh if we're trying to work on uh, let's say the baseline drive and the heels uh, well if of all of a sudden the offense is spacing on the same side there's no one who can be at the help defender well then no no you got to get in a position where we can practice this you know like so we would restrict where they have to be yeah, so you won't even restrict like uh, a space or like shrinking space they can attack in. Um, so to give a to give a perfect example, um, um, we had uh, coaches in the Netherlands and they were explaining, okay, what we can do is that we limit space. For example, we go on three on three, but player A only has the top half of the half court field to his um, to his uh, to his use somebody else at the entire right side and somebody else at the entire left side. So you play three and three, but you only had those three restrictions to play yeah. with. Yeah, we would do that. I mean, the same as Dago's one-on-one. -on -one. He had the three lanes at first, then he had it two lanes. Well, then sometimes we'll play full court one-on-one, -on -one, you got the whole court. It, it, to me, it's, it's, again, what am I trying to achieve? Yeah. And sometimes playing small space is very important because players have to learn to play in a compacted space. But other times they need to play in a bigger space. So it's, it's again, it's, it's, again, I'd have to know what the intent is. It's, it's not an absolute that I think you'll find with us, like with me, especially with international pro, we don't run what I call drills. <laughs> we play games and we to work on what we want to work on. So we don't do a whole lot of drills and this is how we always do a drill. The drill will always end up in playing. So yeah. like we would do some of the closeout, like a lot of Paul's close, we would do that. But it would always end up that we play three on three out of our four and four or two on two out of it. We don't just keep doing a whole bunch of closeouts. We would always end up that we'd go scripted to guide it to compete, or it'd be scripted right to compete. So they're they're always then got to show that they can do what you want them to do. Yeah. So your scripted part would be starting with a with a closeout, going yeah. into that compete right away after that little scripted part, and after that you're gonna go break it down to guide it if you see. We're not doing the closeout on the shooter properly, and we need to pay attention to that yeah. part. Now, having said that, remember, if, if there's a kid really struggling with it, well, then we're making no, okay, in his IPP tomorrow, he's going to have to do a lot more of this because that's what he really needs to work on his form on. But why make everybody do that? That's, that's, that's our point is we're not, we're not teaching to the, the middle anymore. We're, we're teaching more of the individual needs, and we have a, a goal of where we're trying to get to and so we, we've just found that we have this idea that everybody gets equal reps. And this is the same as like Black Lives Matter. This is about equity. This is not about equality. What is equitable is different than what is equal. So we're trying to be much more equitable in our practices than equal. So that everybody doesn't get equal reps on everything. You get the reps that you deserve. Now, remember, this is trained to compete and hire. This is not our learn to train, 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 which would be the younger kids. This is as you start to get into positional play. So you're talking more about under 16 and up, let me say it like that, if we put it- Yeah, that, that'd it. be a good way to say it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 perfect. So we're rounding it up. I don't know, um, I asked in the chat for any, any uh, other questions left. Uh, I haven't received them um, so far. So we're rounding up first in the first round. Um, I want to thank all of you, Mike, for jumping in on the, on the short notice. Uh, thank you so much. Paul Diogo, thank you for sharing your, your information and, and uh, your presentations today. Um, I will be sending out the WeTransfer file um, to all of you. Um, and if you don't receive it, uh, please send me a, a, 
a DM on Twitter so I can send it to you. Um, or I'm going to upload it to YouTube so it's hidden for you to see only um, as it's your presentation and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, guys, thank you very much. And uh, until uh, uh, next time. Thank you, guys. Speak soon, yeah, guys. Everyone. Bye-bye.